Hey crew, it's Ben, and I'm back with another Bible study. Today we are going to be getting back into the book of 1 Samuel. But before we begin, if you are unfamiliar with what I am doing here, I hold some unconventional beliefs, and I'm doing an unconventional Bible study. I'm reading it from front to back, and we are just discussing what it actually says, but that seems to step on toes. If you're lightly offended and not secure in where you are, in your religion, this is probably not the place for you. If you are searching for something different, this might be the place for you. Uh, I suggest starting in Genesis because it is a little hard to keep up if you do not. But other than that, let's dig in. We're going to be back in 1 Samuel. We are starting in 7 because we left off in 6. And we saw the birth and the, the dedication of Samuel. And now, uh, then the Israelites lost the ark. It caused all kinds of damage <clears throat> from the people who captured it, who was the remnants of the Anakim who live in the Gaza area. They have five cities there. There are five Anakim kings that live there, and they are related to Goliath. And so they took the ark. It caused all kinds of problems, and then they sent the ark back by attaching it to some cows, just regular milk cows, and sending them on their way. The Israelites receive the ark back. They celebrate. They kill both the cows. They chop up the the cart. And they burn everything because, you know, radiation. But some of them open it up and they have a hard time. And uh, quite a few of them die. And then they're like, we don't know what to do with this. And that's where we're picking up. And then the men of kiriath Jerem came for the ark of the Lord and took it to Abinadab's house on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to guard the ark of the Lord. And from that day, a long time passed, twenty years in all, as the ark remained at kiriath Jerim. And all the house of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. And then Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all of your hearts, then rid yourself of your foreign gods and asterisks among you. Prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hands of the Philistines. And so the Israelites put away the balls and the asterisks and served only the Lord. And then Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord on your behalf. Let's look at the geography real quick. Mizpah is one of those places that we cannot nail down. We do not have a firm and definite place where it is but we can make an assumption and that's what we're going to do there is a circuit that is being completed by samuel as a judge apparently he is doing a lot of judging and he has three places he judges and one he lives in and so he makes a circuit from bethel to gilgal to mitzvah to home now bethel is here Gilgal is over here on the other side of these mountains. Uh, and his home in Ramah is like, it, this is Ramallah, but that's not quite where it's at. It seems to be more where I have Gibeon labeled down here. And so we're going to make an assumption because the historical account puts it to the northwest. They're just not sure how far to the northwest of, of uh, Jerusalem. So we're going to make an assumption that it's probably over here on this plain around Gezer. It may be farther south. That's possible that it's more directly west than northwest. You would have to go north and west to get there. It's possible that it is a little bit more north. But I'm going to make the reasonable assumption that it is here. And we're going to look at where they're judging from there, right? If you have Bethel, you were judging this hill country. This, this country up here, pieces of this country down here. And if you're at Gilgal, you're judging the Jordan Valley and those east of the Jordan. And so it's a reasonable assumption that when, you're, uh, when we're here, that we're going to be judging the southern portion of the plains out to the coastlands. And so I think it's a reasonable assumption to believe that we're talking about right here. I didn't throw it out a blue mark because we're not certain where it's at, but that's about where we're going to be dealing with for this whole section right here. It's it's a path that he cuts from somewhere in this area over to Bethel to Gilgal 
and then back home. And then he stays at home for a little while and he makes the circuit again, year after year. Kiriath Jerem, however, uh, is down here in the This is Ashdod, which is where about we're talking, right? It's the Gaza Strip, so there are five cities from Ashdod all the way down here to Rafah that are the remnants of the Anakim. That's where they have been driven out to. The Anakim are slightly bigger than other peoples. They, and by slightly, I mean significantly in some cases. <clears throat> but this is the strongholds of the Philistines, and they are the ones that took the Ark. They are the ones that returned the Ark. And what they did was they cut it loose on the roadway, heading in this general direction. And so Kiriath Jerem is up in here somewhere. And when they got the Ark and he killed the 70 people, they left it alone. Nobody touched it. It stayed in the same spot for 20 years. And then finally Samuel was like, you know what? If you're returning to the Lord, we'll go and collect the Ark. And so they did. But he tells them all to gather at Mitzpah, right? And so that's going to cause some tension because Mitzpah is over here, right? And this is why I'm not entirely sure where. Because if they're all gathering here, that makes sense. They don't have control of Jerusalem. Uh, and that is a good centralized location for everybody coming from up here, from down here, from over here. So it makes sense to hold it right there. That makes sense. But it doesn't make sense that unless they held a lot less of this area, like I don't think at this time they hold Eglon in this area, but unless they hold a lot less of this area than we're led to believe, then the Philistines wouldn't been as nervous about them congregating here. But you are also talking about a lot of people, a massive army congregating. So there could be rumors flying for sure. And you gotta, you've got to bear in mind that every time Israel gathers up, it is not good for the people who are living peacefully anywhere. <laughs> and when they had gathered in Mitzvah, they drew water <clears throat> and poured it out before the Lord. And on that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the Israelites at Mitzvah. Now that is a, an actual dispersal of justice type thing uh, it's say your Hail Marys like well, I'm, I'm going to absolve you of your sins because you confess them and when the Philistines heard that the Israelites had gathered in Mitzvah their rulers marched up towards Israel and when the Israelites learned of this they feared the Philistines and said to Samuel do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us that he may save us from the hands of the Philistines <clears throat> And then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on behalf of Israel, and the Lord answered him. As the Philistines drew near to fight against Israel, Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering. But that day the Lord thundered loudly against the Philistines and, and, sorry, and threw them into such confusion that they fled before Israel. Well, that's an interesting turn of events, isn't it? Because they don't have the tabernacle. As far as we know, the tabernacle is still in Gilgal. That is where it is housed. Or the ark. And yet, the man of God makes a sacrifice in an unapproved manner. And it is answered, and it's okay because he was a prophet. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the prophets are going to have to accord with the commandments. That's just going to have to be what it's going to have to be. If it is a prophet of God who has given the commandments, they're going to have to keep with them. And that includes the, the little minutia that they added that aren't really important in the grand scheme of things. And, but if you are operating as the operative of the God who has said, there's only one place you can make a sacrifice, then there's only one place you can make a sacrifice. Now, maybe they moved it there. Maybe they did have the tabernacle there. Maybe they did, but they didn't have the ark. Not yet. And so that is a problem. It's not a major one. It's not even as big as some of the other ones that we've dealt with. And so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but it is something to point out again. 
So the Philistines hear that they're gathered, right? They've got all of Israel's gathered up. That is bad news for the surrounding area. Now you can argue good or bad of what that is, but like the habit has been thus far, not necessarily defense, right? So far they have gone and conquered more than they have been defending anything. And there has been a significant portion of that is dealing inter-tribe. It is not a unified nation by any means. It is at best a theocratic republic at this point. It is 12 independent states supposedly acting cohesively but often fighting with each other. And so Samuel takes this cycling lamb and makes an inappropriate offering before the Lord. But the Lord takes it, so all good. But it's important to note that there was a blood sacrifice required before Israel can have a victory again. Now, we've gone into the blood sacrifice and who requires that and how I think that that's the wrong entity every single time. If there is blood required, then it's the wrong thing. If they're in defense of themselves, got to be on their side if they are correct, right? And so you don't need to kill a lamb for any redemption. You don't need to kill a lamb to... Have courage to fight. You don't need to kill a lamb to not be sinful anymore. And so, it's a problem, and we're going to move on. Then the men of Israel charged out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, striking them down all the way to an area below beth Car. And afterwards, Samuel took up a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, meaning stone of help, saying, Thus far, the Lord has helped us. And so the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped invading the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities from Ekron to Gath, which the Philistines had taken, were restored to Israel, who also delivered the surrounding territory from the hand of the Philistines. And there was peace between the Israelites and the Amorites. So Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Every year he would go on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mitzpah, judging Israel in all of these places. And then he would return to Ramah because his home was there. And there he judged Israel and built an altar to the Lord. And so, again, we have the altar problem, right? Now, maybe he's not making sacrifices there. Okay, if you're not making sacrifices at the altar, apparently that's okay. You can make just a big replica altar, and it's fine. As long as you don't actually make the sacrifice there, right? Otherwise, we've got to put you to death. But it's okay to make an altar and make a sacrifice elsewhere if if you feel like God's made you do it. It's a consistency problem more than anything. Because it's okay for this guy to do this one thing, and then it's not okay for this guy, and then it's okay for this guy again. And that's consistency. God is not inconsistent. Israel demands a king. And then Samuel grew old, and he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. And the name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk his ways. They turned aside towards dishonest gain, accepting bribes and perverting justice. And so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Look, they said, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now, appoint a king to judge us like all the other nations. And when they said, give us a king to judge us, their demand was displeasing in the sight of Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Just as they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now, listen to them, but you must solemnly warn them and show them the manner of the king who will reign over them. And now we have a problem, because the only difference about what is about to happen, right, in theory, is the title. Because Samuel, as the judge, holds that power now. It's not official 
in the way that a kingship makes it. And I understand that. But he holds the power to call people to war. He holds the power to allocate funds for the nation. He holds the power to change the place of worship. He holds the power. And he's a little bit jealous that that power is not going to be passed on to his sons, even though they're doing the wrong thing. His sons, much like Eli's sons, are doing the exact same thing with the religion that has grown up in the years of his judgment. Because he is the righteous judge of Israel. He is the guy who is dispensing justice to him. And he's getting old and people are like, well, dude, you're fixing to die and your kids suck. So maybe we need something a little bit different. Maybe we don't need to rely on randomly somebody popping up and helping us because that's what's happened. They they have this one guy and he comes to the rescue and he does great and wonderful things and he leads them not with an iron hand but with a strong hand. And then when that guy dies, they're left to their own devices and when they're left to their own devices, they get taken over. People come in and oppress them and they don't like that. So they're like, you know what? Let's go to the holy God. The guy who is right now Moses. He is the representative of God. He is the guy that God talks to. And they're like, you know what? Let's go to him and see if maybe there's a better way. We see that there's these people out here who have kings. And maybe we can have a king. Now, I'm not a big one on kingship. I don't like the whole way that it works but I can understand the the wanting to if you have a positive example out there and how about this how about if it was already provided for in your laws like it's already been written in Exodus that when they come for a king and apparently they will here's how you do it and so they're not asking for something out of the box they're not rejecting God by any means you would have to be terribly narcissistic but to get a rejection out of this. Because what happens? Samuel rises up and he helps them to break off the shackles because they repented. And so because that happens, they come to him and they're like, Hey, can you go to God and see about setting us up with somebody who is a righteous ruler? Somebody who, instead of leaving it to chance, God selects through you but that's unfaithful that's rejecting God are you kidding me right for real like are you kidding me that that's rejecting God and the Lord says that they rejected me as their king and okay but you're not here you're not making daily decisions you give them the path and tell us to walk it and we do we walk it to the best of our ability but what we have but that that's not a rejection. It's not a rejection for me to decide that I don't like this job and I want to go to that job. Well, God gave me this job and God's given me that job too. When they're asking for someone to lead them, that is not a rejection of God. That is an accommodation to the circumstance. And God, again, gets petty and jealous. And he's getting jealous because he's got to appoint somebody. Are you kidding me? Like, for real, they go to you to say, hey, can you lead us in the right direction? And then what happens? Enter Saul. And so Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, this will be the manner of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his own chariots and horses to run in front of his chariots. He will appoint some for himself as commanders of thousands and of fifties, and others to plow his ground, to reap his harvest, to make his weapons of war, and to equip his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his servants. <clears throat> he will take a tenth of your grain and grape harvest and give it to his officials and servants. He will take your men servants and maidservants, and your best cattle, and donkeys, and put them to his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourself will become his slaves. 
and when that day comes, you will beg for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you on that day. Really? Now, this is true, right? Whenever you sign up, you swear fealty, you give your loyalty to a king, then you are in service to them. It's the same as when you sign up in the service, the, the U.S. military. I can attest to that. You are no longer a, a person. You are property of the military. Until you get out and are discharged, you are their property. You don't believe that? I got kicked out because I broke government property. I broke my own hand. <laughs> and that's real. And so <clears throat> you don't belong to yourself anymore once you have a king. And so it is better to not be ruled by a king. It is better if everyone can rule their own selves in the manner that God wants you to, the commandments that he wrote on your heart. It is better if, if everyone could do that. That would be great. But that is not humanity. That is not the humanity that God created. The humanity that God created is change and excitement and growth and the opportunity to make the right choices. So we have war because you have the chance to not go to war. And we have destruction because you have the choice to not destroy something. And we are really bad about making those choices. But you go to God and you're like, hey, can you set us up with somebody who will make these choices? And he's like, here's what I'm going to tell you. The guy I'm going to pick for you, this is what he's going to do. Oh, you ain't never looked at it like that? But that's what he's saying. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. This will be the king I choose for you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his own chariots. Why not choose somebody that won't? I mean, if you're going to pick somebody, pick somebody. He will appoint himself commanders of thousands and fifties. That is a necessary function. Like, I get so mad at people with the taxes issue because we pay taxes for a reason. You're not mad that you pay taxes. You're mad that they're used wrong. That's why you're mad. So you should be holding them to account. It's the same with all of this. Like, commanders of thousands and fifties. Well, yeah, if you're going to have an army, then somebody has to lead. You have to choose out commanders. And hopefully, you choose the best commanders you can. Hopefully, you eat out the shitbags like me. Hopefully, like, when I was 18, I was a terrible kid. When I was... I, when I got kicked out of the Navy, I was still pretty bad. It wasn't until I was a grown man that I started grow, turning into a grown man. And so I would have been a terrible choice. Hopefully they weeded them out and they got appropriate commanders. But that doesn't mean that they will. But that's a necessity, right? If you're going to have a nation and it is going to have an army, then you have to have the p people in charge of the army. And you have to have the supply of food. If you are going to defend this land, then you have to feed your soldiers, period. You have to take care of those who fight for you, period. They don't have time to do it. They can't plow the ground. They're wielding a sword. And so you have to, it's part of it. But this part down here where he will take the best of your fields, okay? Granted. Take the best and give to these people because they are keeping me safe so I can sleep. And he will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will be his slaves. If you are paying 10% to God and you are paying 10% to the state, be thankful. Because that is a lot less than there's the tax rates these days for a lot of people, first off. But... That means that you've got 80% of the income coming in and you should have, you have the right to, to demand roads and schools and water that works and all of these things that our taxes are supposed to pay for. And you have the privilege of not having to go out and fix the road yourself and not have to go out and run utilities and all of the things that the state helps with. And you can talk about mismanagement. That's true. I will not argue against that. But the paying of taxes is necessary to the function of a good state. And to, to say that, well, we can just not have a state bull. If you don't have a state, you wind up with the Old Testament. 
And so they were screaming for someone to protect them, to give them a government order. And God's like, all right, bet. But here's what's going to happen. And so he lays it out for them. And then he's like, the guy I'm going to choose, he's going to make you beg for relief. Like he could choose a perfectly righteous person, right? He could make a perfectly righteous person. He could put someone in charge who is going to do the right thing. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to Samuel, they said. We must have a king over us, and then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to judge us, to, to go out before us and to fight our battles. And Samuel listened to all the words of the people and repeated them in the hearing of the Lord, because God couldn't hear it. Listen to their voice, the Lord said to Samuel. Appoint a king for them. And then Samuel told the men of Israel, Everyone must go back to his city. <clears throat> Now there was a Benjamite, a powerful man, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. And he had a son named Saul, choice and handsome, without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the people. So that's not just a head taller than the average. That is a head, or 12 or so inches, taller than every other person at all. That's impressive, right? I wonder where that bloodline would lead. And one of the day, day uh, one day, the donkeys of Saul's father, Kish, wandered off. And Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the servants and go look for the donkeys. And so Saul passed through the hill country of Ephraim and then through the, the land of Shalashah, but did not find the donkeys. He and his servants went through the region of Shalim. But they were not there. And then they went through the land of Benjamin, but still they did not find them. And when they reached the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant, Let us go back or my father will stop worrying about the donkeys and start worrying about us. Now that's a great, that's a large chunk of land. Now, I did not mark them all out, but Ephraim and Benjamin, like this is Benjamin, it's right up in here just above Hebron, I believe, or maybe even part of Hebron. But it's the tiny. It's contained within Judah, and then Ephraim is right below that. And so it's in this general area that they're wandering. And he wanders a long distance. It's long enough that he's worried that his father is going to be concerned about him instead of the donkeys. That's a long way to wander, looking for some donkeys. right? Now, if they had wandered off that far... They had to have been led or stolen. So, But the servant's like, look, said the servant, in this city there is a man of God who is highly respected, and everything he says surely comes to pass. Let us go there now, and perhaps he will tell us which way to go. If we do go, Saul replied, what can we give the man? For the bread in our packs is gone, and there is no gift to take to this man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered him again and said, Look, I have here in my hand a quarter shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God, and he will tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, a man on his way to inquire of God would say, Come, let us go see the seer. For the prophet of today was formerly called the seer, or diviner. Good, said Saul to his servant, Come, let us go. So they set off for the city where the man of God was, and as they were climbing the hill to the city, they met some young women coming out to draw water, and they asked, Is the seer here? Yes, he is ahead of you, they answered. Hurry now. For today he has come to the city, because the people have a sacrifice on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. And after that, the guest will eat. Go up at once, and you will find him. So they're sacrificing, huh? Maybe they're at, at Saul's house, or uh, Samuel's house, where he built an altar. Maybe that's where they set up the tabernacle now, huh? Man, I don't know. Like, How do they just have these sacrifices out of the law in all these places? And it's just fine. Like, this is in the high place. Well, that's a whole problem by itself, because that's where 
Baal and Ashtaroth are worshipped in the high places. Well, it's supposed that they, they got rid of all the, the, the poles, but they're still going to the places. Okay. Okay. So Saul and his servant went towards the city, and as they were entering, and there was Samuel coming towards them on his way to the high place. And on the day before Saul's arrival, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, At this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you are to anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will save them from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. Well, that is not the story we just got. <laughs> and when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke. He shall rule over my people. And Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel re replied. Go up before me to the high place and you shall eat with me today. And when I send you off in the morning, I will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them, for they have been found. And upon whom is all the desire of Israel, if not upon you and all your father's house? And Saul replied, Am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel, and is not my clan the least of all the clans of Benjamin? So why would you say something like that to me, such a thing to me? And then Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall, and seated them in the place of honor among those who were invited, about thirty in all. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, and told you to set aside. And so the cook picked up the leg that was and what was attached to it, and set it before Saul. And then Samuel said, Here is what was kept back. It was set apart for you. Eat, for it has been kept for you for this occasion. From the time I said I have invited the people, so Saul dined with Samuel that day. And after they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the roof of his house. They got up early in the morning, and just before dawn, Samuel called Saul on the roof. Get ready, and I will send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went outside together. And they were going down to the edge of the city. Samuel said to Saul, Tell your servant to go on ahead of us, but you stay for a while, and I will reveal to you the word of God. And so the servant went on. And then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head, kissed him and said, Has not the Lord appointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will find two men at Rachel's tomb in Zelza, on the border of Benjamin. <clears throat> And they will say to you, the donkeys you seek have been found. And now your father has stopped worrying about the donkeys and started worrying about you, asking, what should I do about my son? And then you will go on from there until you come to the Oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. Oh, wait. One carrying three goats, another carrying three loads, and another carrying... A skin of wine, and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from their hands. Are you telling me there's two places to offer sacrifice? That's a problem. That's a problem. And you're going up to the Oak of Tabor. And the Oak of Tabor is the Oak of Divining. It's where the prophetess was sitting, right? This is the same oak over and over and over again. It's a place of power. And three men going up to the God to God at Bethel will give you these things. And after that you will come to Gebeah of God, where the Philistines have an outpost, and you will approach the city and you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place, preceded by harps and tambourines and flutes and lyres, and they will be prophesying. And then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be transformed into a different person. All right, let's see what this word is. I didn't do this yet, so it may be nothing, but where is prophets? Right there. Now, B, a spokesman, a speaker, a prophet. 
the change occurred in Elijah. There's a prophet's guild, Judaic prophets only. Uh, prophets as an official class, false prophets, beside priests, characters as false prophets, heathen prophets. Now, a prophet or generally inspired man. Prophecy or prophecy a prophet. It does not in the text tell us that these are false prophets. And while we do have a definition for the same word being that, it says that they are prophesying. But it appears that that is, instead of what we see a little bit later, a very somber prophecy, right? All the, pretty much, all of the prophets we see going into the prophets are like, wailing and tearing their clothes and throwing dirt on themselves and marrying hookers and like these prophets seem to be pretty damn happy compared to that but they're philistines they're not from you know they're not from god but it's okay you saul you're gonna go and you're gonna join these people these philistines doing this other thing to gebeah of god <clears throat> let's see what that antidote is so the hill of God, Gilead Elohim. And then as you approach, they'll have all of these things and you'll join in and you'll be transformed into a different person. That's interesting. Are you speaking in tongues? Are you singing? What What is going on? And when these signs have come, do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. And you shall go before me to Gilgal and, you, and surely I will come to you and offer burnt offerings. And sacrifice peace offerings. So that's a third place. That is the third place of sacrifice. Wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you are to do. As Saul, <clears throat> as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all the signs came to pass that day. And when Saul and his servant arrived, arrived at Gebeah, a group of prophets met him. And then the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied along with them. And again, is that speaking in tongues? That's what I would assume, but it could just be singing. And all those who had formerly known Saul and saw him prophesying with the prophets asked one another, What has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And then a man who lived there replied, And who is their father? So the saying became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? And when Saul had finished prophesying, he went up to the high place. Now, Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, Where did you go? To look for the donkeys, Saul replied. And when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Well, tell me, Saul's uncle asked, What did Samuel say to you? And Saul replied, He assured us that the donkeys had been found. But Saul did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. Well, that's disobedience. And after this, Samuel summoned up the people to the Lord at Mizpah and said to the Israelites, This is what the Lord of God, <clears throat> the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought Israel up out of Egypt and I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians and all of the kingdoms that oppressed you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all of your troubles and afflictions. And you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now therefore present for yourselves before present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. And thus Samuel had all the tribes of Israel come forward, and the tribe of Benjamin was selected. And then he had the tribe of Benjamin come forward by its clans, and the, the tribe of Matri was se selected. And finally, Saul, had son of, Saul, son of Kish, was selected. But when they looked for him, they could not find him. So again they inquired of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord replied, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. It's interesting to note here <clears throat> that at this point, Samuel already knows who it is that is selected. He has already given instruction to the selected one to go and wait. So why go through the show? 
why go through the show of making them line up by clans? Because you're putting on a show and it's a religion. And Saul was like, that's a big old boy. He's bigger than everybody else I've ever seen by a significant amount. I think God's telling me that. And so that's what he went with. Now, you can take that as heresy. You can take that as whatever. I take it as the most likely situation. And so he chooses this guy out. But that doesn't mean that the guy was the chosen one, right? If the guy you're choosing as king chooses to hide himself among the baggage, it may not be everything that you think it's going to be. And so they ran and brought Saul, and when he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. And Samuel said to all the people, You see the one the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. And then as Samuel explained to the people the rights of kingship, he wrote them on a scroll and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, each to his own home. And Saul also went home to Gebeah, when the men of valor whose hearts God had touched went with him, the king's guard. But some worthless men said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and bought, brought him no gifts. But Saul remained silent about it. So not everybody was happy with Saul. I know that me putting it on Samuel <clears throat> takes away a significant amount from the text. But I try to bear in mind as I read through this that the people who wrote these books are very much establishing a religion. They are very much tailoring things to fit what they need them to. And I'm not discrediting that. I'm not even discrediting that there are prophets and seers and all of these things. I believe all of that's possible. I'm just saying that sometimes the most likely scenario is the one that plays out. And what happens here in particular bears that out. Because out of all of Israel, Saul gets chosen. And the way that it turns out with Saul makes you kind of wonder about God's decision there. Why was David necessary? If Saul could be the hero. This is who God chose. God put it in their hearts that they needed a king. Right? That's how that works. They're all in their hearts like, man, we'd be better off with a king. And so they asked for one. And God doesn't raise up somebody like David then. Instead, he raises up Saul to, to prove a point. Is he the pumpkin guy? And soon Nahash the Ammonite came up and laid siege to Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us and we will serve you. So they're like, You know what? We're not even going to fight. Make a treaty with us and we'll be all right. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I'll make a treaty with you on one condition. That I may put out everyone's right eye and bring reproach upon all Israel. Hold off for seven days, replied the elders of Jabesh, and let us send messengers throughout Israel. If no one is to save us, we'll surrender to you. Perfectly reasonable. You know, it absolutely makes sense that this invading force who is so, so irked off at you that they're like, we'll make peace with you if we can pick out every one of you's right eye. They're just going to say, yeah, we'll wait seven days. Okay. And when the messengers of Gebeah of Saul, when the, the messengers came to Gebeah of Saul and relayed these words in the hearing of the people, they wept, all wept aloud. <clears throat> and then Saul was returning from the field behind his oxen. What troubles the people? asked Saul. Why are they weeping? And they relayed to him the words of the men from Jabesh. And when Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he burned with great anger. He took a pair of oxen and cut them into pieces, 
and sent them by messengers throughout the land of Israel, proclaiming, This is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not march behind Saul and Samuel. And then the terror of the Lord fell upon the people, and they turned out as one man. And when Saul numbered them at Bezek, there were 300,000 Israelites and 30,000 men of Judea. It's interesting to note that now, even during the kingship, those two divisions still remain, Israelites and Judeans. So they said to the messengers who had come, Tell the men of Jabesh Gilead, Deliverance will be yours tomorrow by the time the sun is hot. And when the messengers relayed this to the men of Jabesh, they rejoiced. And then the, Je the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Tomorrow we will come out, and you can do to us whatever seems good to you. And the next day Saul organized the troops in three divisions, and during the morning watch they invaded the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the hottest part of the day, and the survivors were so scattered that no two of them were left together. So what happened? The people of Jabesh said, Okay, we will make treaty with you in the morning. And so the army, not doing their due diligence, I guess, allowed themselves to be attacked before they were awake. That's what the morning watch is. That's the very first one right when everybody is about to wake up and gets their breakfast and relieves the morning watch. And so, once again, Israel through ambush with 300,000 men and 30,000 men. Okay, like the rules of conquest are overwhelm. The rules of conquest are act with subversion. Do all of these things. Like, that is the rules. Like, that's the rules of combat. When by any means necessary. That is the rules of combat. And so I don't fault them for doing it. But I point out that this is the representatives of God. These are the men appointed to God. To go forth in defense of Israel. And they do it by ambush in the middle of the morning. Like as the sun is rising. Before with people who are expecting a treaty. Was the treaty fair? Absolutely not. Would I sign a treaty where you're going to take my eye? No, I'm just going to go ahead and go home. But they tell them people that they're going to do it. And then in the morning, they get ambushed. That is a, a good little pattern that they've got going on there. Have you noticed the pattern? I keep pointing it out. Like if I go out in the service of my God, it's going to be standing on my feet with his name on my lips. It is not going to be sneak attacking somebody in the middle of the night or the middle of the day. It's not. And if I, if my God is not with me enough to stand with you toe to toe, then he wasn't with me at all. <laughs> and tomorrow will come out. And so they, they go in the morning before dawn, during the morning watch, invade the camp and slaughter them until the hottest part of the day, which is like three o'clock in the afternoon and the survivors were so scattered that no two of them were left together and then the people said to Samuel who said that Saul should not reign over us bring those men here so we can kill them but Saul ordered no one shall be put to death this day for the Lord has worked salvation in Israel and then Samuel said to the people come let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingship there and so all the people went to Gilgal and confirmed Saul as king in the presence of the Lord. And there they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord. And Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. It's because the tabernacle never moved. It was always in Gilgal. So they had to go, go to Gilgal anyway. But they did it elsewhere at the behest of the Lord. And so they go back to Gilgal, the hill of foreskins. And... That's where they consecrate the king. And there was already a consecration of the king. He was already declared 
through subterfuge. I, it wasn't Samuel saying, God told me to choose Saul. It was him putting on the ephod with the, the two little lights and going up and being like, is it this one? And it's like, no. And you go to this one and it's like, no. And finally you get to the Benjamites and it's like, yes. And you go by the, you go by the, the, the clan, the individual clans within Benjamite. And finally you get to Kish and it's like, yes. And then it picks somebody who's not even there. I guess they have lots that they go by, right? And so it, it gets to the lot of Saul. But all of it was predetermined. Every step of that was a deception upon the people who believed in it. Every single step of that. Samuel already knew who he was picking. He already knew who was to be king when he called them all there and deceived them all with the ceremony. And that's where we're going to wrap today up. We're gonna, if I get into the next part, it's going to go too long and I will lose what few people to actually do find the study. I know that I hold a very unconventional Bible study. I hope I don't I hope I bring a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion. It is complicated. It is a complicated topic. It is tricky to pick out the deceits and the half-truths and the lies. And I don't claim that it is absolute. Right? I do point out the things that God makes obvious to me. It is blatantly obvious that Samuel deceived the Israelites with the effort. By using that and making them line up, that is deception. He already knew. That is one of the more blatant points of deception, but a lot of this... We're getting to the point now where the accounts are current. So this is where prophecy will start appearing, right? Because prior to this, there wasn't a whole lot of prophecy. There was pieces here and there, but for the most part, all of that is being written right now. Like A good interpretation of the first five books is that it was written by Moses, but it was probably written a little bit after Moses. But the compilation and all of that really happens about now in history. About the time of Samuel right before David, things really start coming together more as a cohesive unit. Now, they did come in and invade the land and take over the land, but then they kind of broke apart into not cohesion at all. It was a very, very loose amalgamation of states, and they didn't get along with each other about a lot of things, including doctrine. That's because it wasn't really gathered yet in the way that it is from here going forward. And so when we start dealing with prophecy and stuff, the things that were actually written and then happened later, those things are coming, but they are not here yet. This is probably put together at the same time as he said that this is going to happen. And like the Lord told me that there would be a man from Benjamin. That, that might have happened, but it probably didn't. Probably what happened was Saul wandered up and Samuel is working out this problem. Who am I going to pick for king? And then this giant dude comes in. And he's like, well, everybody expects some giant dude to be king. That's the biggest fella I've ever seen. Like he is a whole head taller than everybody. He's probably pushing. Like People then were a little smaller than now. The average was smaller, so... He is probably well over six foot, but maybe six and a half, seven foot. Not quite gigantic sizes, but I mean, probably around shack size or something along those lines, right? A professional basketball or football player today. And so he's, he's big and he's impressive looking, but he seems to be a little bit reluctant to take the position and seems to be a bit of a gentle giant. And so I don't personally think that God told Samuel the Benjamite will come I think what he said was look at that dude 
God has given me this guy. He's coming searching for me. And so we're going to make it happen. And that's what happened. And in order to make it seem like it was a prophecy, they just added that one. I could be wrong. I want to make sure that's clear. I know that. But it just seems logical. And I'm just trying to stay logically consistent. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a very complicated topic. I know I step on toes. It is not intentional. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you, God loves you, and you are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. This has been Pitt State. Peace.